I want to thank you all for joining us for this UC San Diego Interventional Psychiatry event. I'm Dr. Terry Schwartz. I'm a psychiatrist and I'm the vice chair of clinical operations and the clinical director for the UCSD eating disorder programs. We have three excellent speakers this afternoon uh, here for you. They'll be discussing both current and investigational interventional psychiatry modalities. And as a briefing, interventional psychiatry is a relatively new area of psych psychiatric treatment where uh, active research and treatment development is progressing quite rapidly. Our understanding of the neurochemistry and neurocircuitry of mental illness and the role of neuroplasticity for learning and making new pathways in the brain allows us to leverage this knowledge to develop new and more effective treatments. Uh, it also allows us to uh, contribute to at least make some contribution to reducing the stigma of mental illness. In my role as clinical director of the UCSD uh, Eating Disorder Clinic, I'm thrilled that we are actually doing uh, research studies looking at uh, psilocybin as well as uh, TMS and the treatment of anorexia nervosa. We see a lot of illnesses, including anorexia, where people seem stuck despite the best of evidence-based uh, medication and psychotherapy. And this is where inter interventional psychiatry has made game-changing strides. So I'm particularly excited to see the UCSD Department of Psychiatry emerging as a leader in the field of interventional psychiatry through research and treatment, including new treatment development. I've also uh, been really grateful and relieved to see some of my longstanding and suffering patients benefit from the life-changing and really some cases life-saving power of these neuromodulatory interventions. The new Dove Canyon Interventional Psychiatry, Psychiatric Clinic reflects UCSD's commitment uh, to develop and improve mental health treatments. With that said, we will start today with a short video to introduce the Dove Canyon Clinic. As everyone knows, and particularly coming out of the pandemic, mental health has become a crisis across the region and across really the country. With the recruitment of the world-renowned expert, Dr. Jeff Daskalakis, as our chair of psychiatry, we brought new innovations in the treatment of psychiatry and mental health disorders to San Diego. I'm so proud to introduce the UC San Diego Health Interventional Psychiatry Dove Canyon location. One in 10 individuals will likely experience depression in their lifetime. You can think of depression as a common element across a number of conditions, both physical and mental conditions. Historically, what had happened is Patients with depression would either receive talk therapy or they would receive medications, which were very effective treatments. Sometimes they were associated with side effects. And a lot of times, probably up to a third, patients simply did not get better. Well, I've had depression since I was 15 and I've had multiple suicide attempts. I could lay in the bed, no TV, no radio, no one to talk to, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. I would just lay there and stare straight at the ceiling for the entire day. I did nothing. Those are the folks that we can now treat. Those are the folks that we can now bring hope to, uh, utilizing these new interventions. My son is 22 years old now, and he has cerebral palsy. His health and well-being is very, very, very important to me which is one of the reasons that I pursued getting help as much as I did, because I have to be fair to him. We are the academic institution for this community. It's a place where discoveries are made and then are brought to the bedside and new treatment interventions. And so it's a natural place for us to develop new treatments and really get to the bottom of understanding a condition like depression. Dove Canyon was recently opened, is opened as a, as a center that specifically focuses on how do we manage resistant depression, making breakthroughs every day to understand how the brain biology links to severe mental illness. We need to take away the shame that comes along with any mental health. Today is the day to go get access and treatment. And what better place to go and get it in safe and trained hands where you have access to a multidisciplinary team, experts in psychiatry, experts in anesthesiology, so that you can pursue your life and lift this heavy burden off your shoulder. With Dr. Daskalakis, we are elevating our use of TMS. Transcranial magnetic stimulation involves repeated pulses of magnetic fields to the front part of the brain called the frontal cortex. And when you stimulate the brain in a repeated way, you get neurons to fire together.
together. And when neurons fire together, they wire together. This is a very safe, very effective, and easy to tolerate treatment. And to be able to impact over 50% of patients in a positive direction and help them recover from depression, I think is a game changer for our field. I was willing to try anything to get my life back. And that's how I started with TMS. And so everybody has been just blown away by how, how I feel now. And I just exude it, I guess. <laughs> we have ketamine as a anesthetic drug that has been found to have amazing effects in lifting depression. Psilocybin is now being considered an appropriate intervention, much like ketamine, having some of the same neurochemistry, and we will be looking at that as that becomes a more appropriate intervention. Philanthropy is has an enormous impact, not only in relation to actual dollars spent. These treatments that we have, and these discoveries that we make often start as a kernel, an idea in someone's mind, an epiphany that people have. Um, and those ideas, those innovative ideas, those solutions, those epiphanies need to be funded at a grassroots level. And to do that, philanthropy is pivotal. I have the ability and the energy now to do things and to be myself and this is so much different than somebody that's lived with depression forever. I'm there for my son, there for my husband. Our marriage is so much better now than it was. I feel like I, I'm starting a, a whole new life. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Daskalakis, who joined UC San Diego in August of 2020 as the chair of the Department of Psychiatry. His distinguished research career has focused on better understanding of the neurophysiology of severe psychiatric disorders with an emphasis on the role of inhibition, excitation, and neuroplasticity in the pathophysiology and treatment uh, mechanisms in schizophrenia, depression, and obsessive compulsive disorder. He's led uh, numerous treatment studies using transcranial direct current stimulation, repetitive transcranial uh, magnetic brain stimulation, and magnetic seizure therapy for refractory symptoms in these disorders. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you, Terry, for the warm introduction. I, uh, I'm, I, it's an honor and a privilege to be here presenting to you today. Um, as you heard, I, my expertise is in neuromodulation uh, and specifically for resistant psychiatric disorders. When I first uh, considered applying for psychiatry way back in the mid nineties, I, I thought about what an incredible, um, opportunity it was um, at a time when psychiatry was, was actually not one of the most popular specialties. Um, things have changed in, in the last uh, you know, 30 years uh, considerably. Uh, we have new groundbreaking treatments. We have uh, new innovations, but it wasn't always like that. We hit a real roadblock about 10 or 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, where we didn't see a lot of innovation in treatment. Um, our medications were not showing to be as effective as we initially thought, and they were causing side effects which were difficult for many patients to tolerate. Our medications um, in depression work uh, probably about two thirds of the time. That's the uplifting message. Um, the concerning message is that our medications actually fail in about a third of patients that we treat. And sometimes that extends upwards of 40% uh, of patients when you look at things over a prolonged period of time. So being able to offer new treatments uh, is important. And I'm, I, I'm actually um, humbled at the fact that early in my career, I was able to gain access to this groundbreaking treatment called transcranial magnetic stimulation at a time when no one had heard about it. And so we persevered and we struggled and we worked tirelessly to build um, treatment trials for patients with depression because we knew that these would be a game changer for the field. We also worked uh, diligently to understand how the brain works and how these treatments work for depression. And we made considerable breakthroughs. We innovated in relation to TMS, which has become one of the, the most um, innovative and um, transformative treatments uh, for a substantial proportion of patients um, who experience depression. Uh, and those numbers are staggering when you take it into consideration at national and international level. 
These treatments actually work not only for treating depression, but they actually work in preventing people from committing suicide. One of the most harmful, one of the most dangerous, and one of the most tragic events that can emerge in a person's life. There's two elements of suicide. One is to be struggling with um, thoughts of wanting to kill yourself. And then, of course, more tragically, is when people end their lives because they're struggling with symptoms. I re recall being um, having dinner one night and hearing of this, the story of how um, um, uh, famous, a famous comedian had taken his life, Robin Williams, had taken his life um, because he had been struggling with depression and knowing that in my hands, I had a treatment that worked very effectively to save patients' lives. And this is something that was not always the case and, and something that I'm tremendously proud of and that we've created tools that save lives, that change uh, the trajectory of illness and that have a meaningful and lasting impact on people's wellness and recovery. We have made tremendous strides in also understanding um, treatments and how treatment mechanisms work in the brain. And one of those key mechanisms is a process uh, I think many of us heard of called neuroplasticity or the rewiring of the brain. And we're learning so much about neuroplasticity and these treatments we think work very effectively in managing neuroplasticity. TMS works by laying new wires in the brain, um, wires that were previously rendered dysfunctional with illnesses like depression. And I think this new era of psychedelics and ketamine are working through um, similar mechanisms, but rather than creating new wires, we're recasting um, how these treatments work by, by laying a new groundwork in the brain that allows rewiring to take place in more healthy and innovative ways. So these treatments are, are rapidly emerging, they're transforming, and they're leading to breakthroughs in the way we deliver care. And I am actually thrilled and excited to be able to be involved in some of this game-changing work, being able to offer new treatments to our patients that were previously inaccessible, and being able to lead it in, in, a, in a university uh, and in a health system like the UC San Diego and this incredible department uh, and being able to make the breakthroughs that will affect positively in all of our lives. I wanna thank you for joining us today. And it's my pleasure and honor to, to, to be able to showcase some of these innovative treatments that, we, that we, uh, what we've heard about this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dasmalekis. Next, uh, we will be uh, hearing uh, uh, Dr. Weissman. He'll be presenting via video as he's actually en route from Toronto to join the UC San Diego psychiatry team to serve as head of neuromodulation. Dr. Weissman is passionate about clinical care and research in interventional psychiatry and has interest in brain stimulation, as well as special interest in novel psychopharmacological compounds such as psychedelics and ketamine. His current research is focused on the development of novel interventions for suicidality and other forms of severe mental illness. He has published on the potential role for RTMS, magnetic seizure therapy, and psychedelic compounds as treatments for suicidality as well as depression. He's originally also from Toronto, completed his medical degree at uh, Vancouver, Vancouver, British Columbia in 2015 before returning to Toronto to specialize in psychiatry with subsequent fellowship training in brain stimulation at the Center for Addiction uh, and Mental Health under Dr. Jeff Daskalakis. Dr. Weissman has an ongoing work, close working relationship with Dr. Daskalakis, and he's excited to join the team at UC San Diego in Southern California, and apparently is looking quite forward to learning how to surf while eating many fish tacos. Take it away, here's Dr. Weissman. Hi there, I'm Dr. Corey Weissman. And I'm very excited to join the neuromodulation team at UCSD. Our team is hoping to further develop interventional treatments that are both very effective and lead to rapid improvements for treatment-resistant mental illness. Right now, our team focuses mainly on neuromodulation, which is an umbrella term for treatments like RTMS, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, and ECT, or electroconvulsive therapy, both of which use forms of electromagnetic energy to target the brain as forms of treatment. These are treatments that have strong evidence for them, and they've helped countless patients in the past. We're also very excited to develop a new treatment called magnetic seizure therapy or MST, 
which is being headed by the chair of our department, Dr. Daskalakis, a pioneer in the field. While patient care is our top priority, we plan to also advance the understanding of how the science works for these treatments so that we can enhance their effectiveness overall for our patients and also start to individualize treatments. Because of the collaborative UCSD environment, we are lucky also to work with world-class scientists who study animal and cell models of disease and help us refine treatments for our patients with translational type research. There's multiple lines of evidence that suggest neuroplasticity, which is an important part of how neuromodulation treatments work, is something that we hope to study in detail in the future. Neuroplasticity essentially means changes in nerve cell structure in the brain. You can think of it as cells that fire together, wire together. Cells that discharge together or depolarize together become connected and change their structure in doing so. These changes happen on the microscopic level at the cell level in the brain. And we then see changes that are affecting the entire brain on what we call the circuit level with thousands and millions of neurons playing a role. So in other words, by stimulating specific parts of the brain, we can rebalance abnormal circuits that can be found in mental illness. RTMS or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation is a very useful tool for experimenting with neuroplastic effects in the brain. And this is because not only can we target specific brain regions with RTMS, we can also modify things like treatment frequency, intensity, and depth of stimulation. We hope to come up with careful approaches in large clinical trials in order to study in detail how different forms of RTMS can lead to changes in patient outcomes in our studies. Beyond neuromodulation, our team studies other interventional treatments like ketamine and psilocybin, psilocybin being a psychedelic compound. While these drugs have been around for a long time, they have far less research into them than neuromodulation. And unlike RTMS or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, because they are drugs, they flow through the entire brain and lead to dynamic large scale effects on the molecular, cellular, and circuit level. These compounds also have effects on many non-brain organs too. And so our team believes and is excited around the ability to study ketamine and psilocybin and other psychedelic compounds because we believe that these compounds are poised to massively improve our treatment toolkit in the coming years in psychiatry. There's a lot of hope that clinical trials with these, com with these compounds will continue to show large, long-lasting positive effects for people with severe mental illness. In terms of how they work, we have a good sense of what the major cell level receptor targets are for ketamine and psilocybin. We also know that these compounds can lead to large neuroplastic changes in the brain, kind of like RTMS or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation and other neuromodulation techniques. I think that we will find signatures of brain measures for patients who respond to specific treatments and that this will lead to personalization of treatments for treatment resistant illness. This is a major goal in psychiatry in general, and it would be a huge improvement from the current frustrating standard of practice, which is essentially trial and error treatment management. Over time, we will incorporate more and more interventional pharmacological treatments like other psychedelic compounds such as LSD and DMT. And we will further develop technology to investigate these compounds with the goals of advancing our field and helping more patients. The limits of exploration in these areas are truly endless, which is exciting both scientifically and provides hope for our patients. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm very much looking forward to joining all of you in San Diego. Hope to see you soon. I'll be there in the fall. Take care. Great. I would thank uh, Dr. Weissman. Um, you can see why we're so excited to have him join us. Uh, next, uh, we will have uh, Dr. Bill Perry. Uh, he received his PhD with honors from the California School of Professional Psychology in 1989, completed his internship and postdoctoral fellowship at UC San Diego. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Neuropsychology and Society for Personality Assessment past president, also past president of the National Academy of Neuropsychology. 
and he is now the executive director. Dr. Perry served as a clinical division architect and co-director in the Department of Psychiatry for over six years. His current role is uh, vice chair for program development and operations in psychiatry. He also serves as the chief supervising psychologist at UC San Diego Health, and clinically, he engages in consultations and neuropsychological assessments. Dr. Perry's primary research program focuses on inhibitory and information processing deficits in neuropsychiatric conditions. He is the recipient of several NIH grants to study psychiatric patients with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, using psychophysiological measures to characterize their cognitive function. Additionally, he is interested in studies involving cannabis and the cannabinoid, endocannabinoid system in psychiatric patients and people with HIV infection. Most of his publications in NIH grants are on patients with bipolar illness and schizophrenia. He has published extensively on people with viral diseases such as HIV, hepatitis C. Additionally, Dr. Perry is involved in several national work groups on population health solutions for the assessment and treatment of behavioral health conditions. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Perry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schwartz. It is really a pleasure for me to share with you my excitement in the opening of Dove Canyon and the recruitment of Dr. Daskalakis and what this means to San Diego. For the past seven years, we at UCSD Psychiatry have focused on filling a gap that exists in our community by creating a dedicated center where research and treatment of depressive disorders can exist. With the opening of Dove Canyon, we have the opportunity to bring together world-class researchers that exist already at UCSD and clinicians from across the university with a common purpose to better understand, diagnose, treat, and hopefully one day uh, prevent severe depression. I truly believe that this clinic can become a center and be a game changer for San Diego. I don't think, uh, I think we're all aware of how prevalent depression is. It's the number one cause of disability across the world. Approximately 10% of US adults experience depression in any given year. And studies have suggested that 25%, as many as 25% of women and 15% of men have experienced some sort of a depressive disorder during their lives. Perhaps what is not as widely known is that major depressive episodes are common among transitional age adolescents. At over 3 million adolescents, or around 13% of our population, have had a major depressive episode. So we know that the mood neurocircuitry is already being impacted at this very early age. As we know, depression affects every aspect of one's life. Depression can lead to physical health problems, including fatigue, sleeplessness, and substance use disorders. It's associated with physical conditions such as heart disease, respiratory illness, and neurological illnesses. So whether depression initially emerges as a primary biological condition or as a reaction to circumstances in one's life or a medical condition, it leads to a common pathway. And this common pathway is of isolation, loneliness, despair, poor self-esteem, and unfortunately, sometimes suicide. In this way, depression affects the lives of those we love, our work environment, and impacts every aspect of our day-to-day -day experience. The good news is, as Dr. Daskalakis shared, most people who receive treatment for depression will experience improvement in their symptoms. But what happens when those standard treatments aren't enough or when symptoms don't improve, only to keep coming back? That's what treatment-resistant depression is about. There have been many stories of people living with depression and creating a lifestyle that compensates for this condition. They become isolative and self-deprecating. They see their world as dark and feel helpless, dull, unable to move, and most importantly, they lack hope that the feeling will or can ever change. I've had patients tell me that their family members have suggested that they prefer to be depressed or that they're not trying hard enough uh, to improve, and this leaves patients to feel like it's hopeless, why even try more? I recently came across a quote on the internet from a person who has treatment-resistant depression, and she said, I might have a honeymoon period where an antidepressant works for a while, but then it stops helping. So I try something new, and then I try something else. I feel like I'm beating my head up against a wall. What's the point? 
The fact is that treatment-resistant depression is not widely understood by the community. Most importantly, that there are new treatment options which can help with this condition. That is one of our roles here at the university, to educate our community and the approximately 80 to 100,000 San Diegans that may have treatment-resistant depression. I want to say that again. There's 80 to 100,000 of our fellow citizens of San Diego that may be experiencing treatment-resistant depression. And they need to know that that's when it's time to consider a more intensive approach, such as what we offer here at Dove County. Treatment-resistant depression is complex. It can stem from a variety of causes, so we need to start with a careful evaluation to gather as much information as possible and to create the best individualized treatment plan for the patient. We take a deep look at the past and current symptoms and previous treatments, what's been successful. Once we have gathered as much information as we need, we consult with the patient about the next steps in the process. Now, much of what you're hearing today is focused on RTMS to treat treatment-resistant depression, or TRD, but we have other options in our arsenal to select from, and Dr. Weissman introduced some of these. One such treatment is ketamine, which is used either to augment the effects of TMS or in place of neurostimulation. Ketamine traditionally has been used as an anesthetic. It is a medication that is delivered typically through an IV in low doses, and the results can be rapid and can last from days to weeks. Usually it's given in decreasing frequencies over several weeks. The FDA has approved an intranasal form of this called esketamine or spravato. That's given in our clinic. Esketamine is for adults who've tried at least two other antidepressant medications that did not adequately control their symptoms. Ketamine and esketamine work in the brain in a different way than the standard antidepressants that we use. So each can typically be used along with an oral antidepressant. But here's what's exciting. What's in store for the future? Under Dr. Daskalakis, we continue to learn more about who benefits from TMS, to develop new approaches and techniques in the use of TMS, employing different stimulation exposures, delivery frequencies, different localizations to different brain sites, you heard Dr. Weissman talk about the promise of TMS and EEG together. You heard that Dr. Daskalakis is pioneering a new technique called magnetic seizure therapies, which perhaps he can describe in more detail during the Q&A period. There's also a host of new promising drug treatments that are gaining a great deal of attention. You heard Dr. Weissman refer to psilocybin and other psychedelics. Although right now there's some limited conclusion that can be drawn about their efficacy, particularly for psilocybin, the data shows impressive tolerability and symptom improvements. These improvements appear rapidly just after one or two psilocybin treatment sessions, and the depression symptoms seem to remain significantly reduced uh, six months post-treatment. So we're real excited about this paradigm for unresponsive depression, uh, and we will continue to be researching it and hopefully incorporate that into our treatment protocols as it becomes uh, approved. I also think we should take a moment to underscore the benefits of ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, which has been used for over 75 years and is really a highly effective treatment and very often used in the most severe cases of depression. It does offer rapid, very effective treatment for depression. It's a non-invasive procedure involving the use of brief general anesthesia and electrical stimulation to induce a controlled generalized seizure. It's been shown to be a robust treatment for depression when medications and psychotherapy are not enough or ineffective. And it's particularly effective for the treatment of geriatric depression uh, when no other treatments have been useful. Unfortunately, it has a very bad reputation largely due to how it was portrayed in the movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, interestingly, um, my initial work in the field was in the Northeast, and ECT is much more popular there than it is in California. But importantly, under, at UCSD and under Dr. Daskalakis and our clinical team, we're now using new technical ECT procedures that bring about, bring about symptomatic relief while minimizing the side effects. So in closing, I want to summarize. There are 300 million 
worldwide suffering from depression in eight to 10 million people in the US alone that have treatment resistant depression. I'm cautious because the term treatment resistant might seem to imply that there is no hope, but we can now offer hope to people who've struggled and who've assumed that depression as they've experienced it would be with them for a lifetime. As Ms. Landhurt shared in the video, with treatment, she's now present to be with her family, able to start a whole new life. I can't begin to tell you the great satisfaction that this gives all of us who work in this area. And together with your support, we can continue to pursue clinical and research opportunities, importantly, train the next generation of researchers and clinicians to advance depression care and improve the quality of life for our patients and their families. This is a very exciting time. This is a very exciting moment for psychiatry and for San Diego. And thanks for being, and thanks for letting me share my excitement with you today. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Uh, we will be moving into our Q&A, but I first would like to introduce uh, Dr. Saeed. She's an associate clinical professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at UC San Diego and serves as the director of the acute pain service. She completed her medical degree education at UCLA, followed by anesthesiology residency training at uh, USC and UC San Diego. Dr. Daskalakis, uh, are these interventions, particularly TMS, useful for anxiety and OCD? It's a very good question. Um, the original indications for TMS were in depression. Um, in the last several years, though, we've seen an expansion of those indications. And actually, um, most recently, we've also seen an expansion of indications in relation to anxiety. I'll explain what I mean. Uh, the FDA has recently approved um, TMS um, for uh, treatment-resistant obsessive compulsive disorder, um, which, is, which is a game changer because we're stimulating a slightly different part of the brain compared to depression. Um, it just highlights how um, important neuroscience is in understanding the brain because it basically allowed us to understand the circuitry associated with OCD, uh, differentiated the circuitry uh, between OCD and depression. And now we have another treatment spot um, that, is, that is closely linked to the anterior cingulate uh, that we can now stimulate with a particular type of TMS coil that is, is, is larger, involves a more intense field, but very easy to tolerate. And so OCD is an approved treatment um, that we're offering here at Dove Canyon. Uh, TMS is an approved treatment for OCD that we're offering here at Dove Canyon. Uh, and as far as anxiety is concerned, there has been a recent expansion of the indication for TMS for other anxiety disorders in relation to depression, meaning that we can, the data suggests that when you treat depression, um, you can effectively manage the anxiety associated with the depression. Um, it's not just the depression that responds, it's the anxiety that responds as well. And so these are very effective treatments, both for OCD, which is a, a, um, a specific type of anxiety disorder, but also for, for generalized anxiety that often co-occurs with depression. In fact, the incidence is about 60 to 80%. And so these treatments don't only respond to, depression is not the only um, illness that responds to treatment with TMS. There are others as well, and we're starting to see expansion of the number of treatment indications that we have available. Along those lines, I should also mention one important thing. When we talk about depression, we, we often think about unipolar depression, but we are seeing these treatments emerge for other types of depression. Bipolar depression is often a treatment that is, that is used. It's not currently approved by the FBA, FDA, but our hope is that we see expansion of indications. And we've certainly seen lots of patients respond with bipolar depression to TMS. What we've also seen as patients with comorbid conditions. If you experience depression in the context of schizophrenia, if you experience depression in the context of autism spectrum disorders, we've seen uh, and published on data showing significant therapeutic efficacy in those other disorders. Whenever you're experiencing another psychiatric disorder, depression often um, follows. And the ability to treat depression in those specific patient populations, I think is, is, is a considerable area of innovation. The other area of innovation is seeing patients who have comorbid medical conditions and respond um, to TMS. So if you have a comorbid medical condition that, un, that, that contributes to you experiencing depression, we know that medications um, don't work as effectively, and yet TMS is a, is a, a perfect solution 
for those types of, of illnesses. And our hope is one day we'll see treatments like ketamine and perhaps even the psychedelics work effectively for those patient populations. Great, thank you. This one is for Dr. Saeed, I believe. Um, what is ketamine FDA approved for and uh, both uh, acute and chronic conditions? I, so currently um, ketamine, when I refer to IV ketamine was approved for anesthetic doses for um, as a sole or part of a multimodal anesthesia. Um, however, we do use it for the treatment of acute and chronic pain, um, even though it's not quite FDA labeled for that. Um, it's actually part of our guidelines through the American Society of Anesthesiology for treatment uh, for chronic pain and acute surgical pain. So um, in sub anesthetic doses. However, as we alluded to earlier, uh, nasal ketamine spravato has been FDA, formally FDA approved in March 2019 for the treatment of ketamine. Thank you very much. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Perry. Doctors are charging up to $10,000 for ketamine infusions. Your thoughts? Well, uh, or maybe Saeed, Dr. Saeed will have a thought. Yeah, uh, I, there, uh, that, that seems a little high. Uh, uh, ketamine infusions, uh, some, I, we know that uh, people in the community are charging a variety of amounts. We have, uh, we're always mindful to be uh, providing services that are uh, manageable for our patient population. Um, and um, it could be that $10,000 might be a package that they're offering, I don't know, I can't comment specifically to what it is that they're, why they charge 10,000 and what the services that they're providing are. Um, but um, that's, I don't know, Dr. Saeed, do you have more to say? You're pretty familiar with the community yes. and what's happening. Um, so as far as pricing within the San Diego um, community, we do plan to offer competitive pricing, but I, um, I think our service um, is unique and far more outstanding because we um, use the expertise of both psychiatry and anesthesiology to deliver ketamine in a safe uh, and uh, with high efficacy in a comfort environment. So um, many ketamine clinics, as I'm sure um, you know, you've heard or seen, um, you can walk in and request to have IV ketamine treatment, whether you have a proper full evaluation is questionable. Um, so here we um, require that every single one of our patients who comes in is evaluated uh, by a trained physician. And then when the ketamine administration IV portion is being supervised by a anesthesiologist who has um, expertise in the management of side effects of ketamine. I, I might just add that uh, one of the things that we hope to do, and I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure that there are other responsible folks in the community who are using ketamine, but ketamine, TMS, ECT, uh, and other treatments are all part of what someone like Dr. Daskalakis is going to consider when patients come in. And there may be uh, at times that we use augmentation strategies. So it may be TMS plus ketamine. Uh, or So we're not just looking at any single modality, but utilizing the skills of our trained clinicians to determine what is the best um, treatments, uh, not just treatment, but treatments uh, to address one's symptoms. Thank you. Dr. Daskalakis, does TMS appear to work more effectively in some kinds of depression presentation than others, people with more neurovegetative symptoms or more typical uh, depression features? Uh, that's a terrific question. So far, the data suggests that when TMS works, it works across um, a wide spectrum of, of depressive symptoms. It just so happens that some of the neurovegetative features respond very favorably to TMS, much like what we learned in the past when we saw that ECT also worked very effectively in treating some of the neurovegetative symptoms. In fact, one of the indications for ECT historically has been catatonia, which is a profound motor change where people can't speak, they can't eat, 
they, uh, they don't engage with society. ECT had had a profound impact on those patients. ECT is, is an extraordinarily effective treatment, as Dr. Perry mentioned. It's one of the most stigmatized and vilified treatments that we have, even though it works incredibly effectively. And, and we have seen with TMS most recently innovations that are pushing the efficacy of TMS close to, if not surpassing that of ECT. So I'm confident that, that we'll start to see an emergence of, of, with new research, an emergence of indications, an emergence of uh, treatment for different symptoms, but also just expanded efficacy of TMS so that we can one day replace TMS, uh, replace ECT with TMS um, and continue to innovate. Can you also say something about uh, magnetic seizure therapy? Sure, thank you. I'm glad you, you raised it. So Terry, the um, electroconvulsive therapy produces seizures for therapeutic purposes. Now you may think that that's paradoxical. Why would you wanna have uh, produce a seizure and how could a seizure impart um, therapeutic change in the brain? And in, in reality, um, the, this treatment has been a, a, a lifesaver for people over the, over the last several decades. And as Dr. Perry mentioned, we're refining our treatment modalities to try to minimize, minimize side effects while maximizing therapeutic um, efficacy. The, the strategy that we're taking here at UCSD in the Department of Psychiatry is to first utilize TMS, ketamine, and potentially some of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, psychedelics as the least invasive route to treat depression. However, we are expecting that there will still be a proportion of patients, regrettably, that do not respond to those treatments. Those patients would otherwise go and get uh, or need to be offered ECT. And so the question is, can there be an intermediary step? Can we introduce something that is less, uh, that is as effective, but doesn't have the same side effect profile that ECT does. And the answer is yes. And in fact, the answer is that we have blended a combination of the therapeutic properties of TMS along with the therapeutic properties of ECT into a treatment known as magnetic seizure therapy, which uses magnets to produce seizures and not electrical fields. That might seem a small and, and maybe even insignificant point, but it is actually quite significant. And the reason it's significant is that magnetic fields are very tailored, they're very targeted, and they're very focal. So they, they are specific to producing therapeutic seizures in the frontal part of the brain, sparing deeper parts of the brain that are associated with memory formation. And so what you have is you have a treatment that can produce therapeutic seizures without the memory side effects that everyone is um, afraid of. Uh, and, and in fact, if we've just recently published data in the last year showing that all of the therapeutic potential of ECT is preserved while sparing the cognitive side effects that are associated with ET, ECT. And we're, we're currently involved in trials where we hope that in the next few years, magnetic seizure therapy will be yet another FDA approved treatment for depression. Thank you very much. Uh, I can take part of this next one. What is the reimbursement with commercial um, and Medicare for these procedures? Um, both uh, commercial and Medicare um, do uh, approve with uh, uh, reasonable uh, previous trials. Uh, and it varies from insurance to insurance for uh, TMS. Um, they don't approve um, ket an IV ketamine. Um, there is, I don't know what rate, and uh, maybe Bill or Jeff know um, uh, how much they're approving for um, intranasal or spravato. So those, they, those, I know that they, they, I have had people approved for Spravato and I think we're probably still working on, on getting those, uh, those approvals, but it is, once something is FDA approved, it becomes much easier to get um, insurance to cover it. When it's not FDA approved, they can toss it out, which is, for, from my experience, which is so important in our patients with bipolar disorder, getting TMS, for, which, which has done really well in, in bipolar patients, and unfortunately, um, uh, until they go through the FDA approval, it's hard to get insurance companies to cover that. Any other comments on that, Dr. Daskalakis or Bill? I, yeah, I'm glad you know, the way you characterized it, Terry, was perfect. I think what we're, uh, what we're seeing 
is not only expertise in delivering these, these innovative treatments, but we're also de um, developing considerable expertise in just being able to properly um, diagnose and properly uh, manage the patient who has resistant depression. In other words, we want to be able to, to rapidly identify resistant depression and make a very compelling case that these are the treatment, these are the novel treatments that should be used in this patient population. Um, to do that requires a fair bit of expertise. You know, if you're uh, if you if you have a, a, a significant back pain, you go you want to go to a back pain specialist. If you have um, you know, a particular problem with your retina, you want to go to a retinal specialist. And, and um, uh, we are currently uh, evolving our expertise so that we have considerable um, um, expertise, um, considerable um, areas of innovation in these particular types of illnesses, treatment-resistant depression, treatment-resistant bipolar depression, and other types of depression, so that we can, we can make a compelling case for getting these treatments approved and make, making sure that we're offering the right treatment to the right patient. Can, can I make a, a follow-up comment to that? Um, it, one of the critical things, the re, one of the reasons why the building a center for depression and particularly for treatment resistant depression is so important uh, and has been on the top of our strategic priorities for psychiatry and for UCSD health is that we're not simply utilizers of a technique. Uh, by having a center, by having expertise like uh, that which Dr. Daskalakis brings, he is a center where people communicate the latest findings, where together we're doing research with colleagues at Stanford and Yale, continue to do research with folks in, in Toronto, um, where this information comes together. So we're constantly evolving our approaches. And to his point, that allows us to have the strength and uh, the uh, confidence and the ability to engage with insurance companies so that they are moving along and getting our, these treatments approved for patients who otherwise they end up paying a uh, you know, considerable amount of money uh, in trying to manage these folks. So I, I do think that, uh, the future is bright. And I think the fact that we are becoming this center um, will, uh, help expedite this process. And I'm looking at some of the questions that were sent in ahead of time uh, and one that was asked by many people. Um, and uh, I believe Jeff may have the answers to this. Um, are, there, uh, are these therapies available to people who've been on medication for depression for many years? Yes, regrettably, uh, that's an excellent question. Regrettably, what we see oftentimes is patients who have been on trial after trial after trial um, of medications with no end in sight. Uh, but we know from literature that's been published now for over a decade that when multiple medications work, sorry, when multiple medications are used, their ability to, to change and produce therapeutic response diminishes with each trial of medication. That's not true for TMS. What is true is that we need to be able to rapidly identify that person who has treatment resistant depression. That is the person who has failed one or two trials. And, and the data suggests that the faster we identify those patients, the faster we get them, we, we have those patients treated with TMS, with ketamine, perhaps in the future with psychedelics, the better their response Will be. So it's important not to, to allow these people who have de resistant depression to stay on medications too long with the faint hope that they're going to get better. It's important to get them into treatment, into these novel treatments sooner rather than later so that we can do our job and get these folks better in a short period of time. Thank you. Um, Dr. Saeed, what, can you comment on the safety of ketamine um, for treatment-resistant depression in the elderly? Um, yes, we, we have many elderly patients who actually come in through UCSD also for large operations, and we um, are very familiar with, with using low-dose uh, sub-anesthetic sub -anesthetic doses of ketamine for the management of pain. Um, with close uh, monitoring, there's some mild and relatively self-limiting side effects that they could potentially experience, including 
um, changes in blood pressure or some perceptual uh, disturbances um, or some dissociative side effects where sort of um, where patients can have this out of body feeling experience. But again, um, most of the side effects are mild and can are self-limiting. And for our older populations, we would consider starting on a lower dose um, over the course of a 40 minute infusion and then future infusions based on how well they tolerate it, we would adjust these doses. And um, like everyone has mentioned, we really want to focus on um, individualized treatments and personalized medicine for our patients. Um, so we take all these factors into account. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and Bill, you may be able to answer this. How can people participate in controlled psychedelic uh, therapy and what costs are associated with treatment? Or where are we at with that at this point? Right, so uh, presently, uh, let me start with the treatment arm first. Uh, treatment is um, presently restricted to our use of ketamine. Um, we are not using uh, psilocybin or LSD or any of the other psychedelics for treatment purposes. Um, with Dr. Weissman coming on board, uh, he will uh, be looking at some research, clinical research opportunities, and there'll be recruitment options there. Uh, we have uh, a network of folks who are working in the field of psychedelics, uh, as well as in TMS, with looking at the neuroplasticity. One of the things I think that's important is not only the clinical trials that are associated with this, but really understanding uh, what are the neural circuitry um, changes that take place with these various treatments. So I think that uh, you'll see a lot more research, again, with Dove Canyon and with Dr. Daskalakis being here, this is going to be a lightning rod for people coming together, doing collaborative research here at UCSD uh, to further uh, elucidate how these, uh, these medications uh, work in combination with uh, neurostimulation. So in terms of uh, trials, we did uh, participate in a clinical trial with psilocybin, one of our Senior uh, clinicians, uh, Dr. Sid Zisik, who participated in that trial. I believe that trial is currently closed. Um, I will say that hey, psilocybin, psilocybin. Oh, psilocybin is gotten, has been given a breakthrough designation by the FDA. So um, I'm hopeful that there will be an opportunity to use psilocybin as a therapeutic intervention in the coming future but uh, stay, stay in touch. Um, and uh, for Dr. Daskalakis, are there any studies comparing uh, uh, medications versus um, TMS or RTMS or other types of electronic stimulation? Sure, so there have been, uh, there have been studies that have compared TMS to medications. And, and what we found is that TMS um, medications work, uh, but only, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a work at, to a limited degree and limited extent uh, when, when you identify treatment-resistant depression, whereas um, TMS works upwards uh, of about 30 or 40% and probably about 20, 20 or 30% more efficacious than medications are in this resistant patient population. Um, all this to say that, that, that TMS um, is not a perfect treatment yet. I think that's where the science comes in. I think we're continuing to advance and enhance it and, and look through more effective ways of delivering the treatment to the brain. Um, one of the major innovations most recently is the um, development of what's called theta burst stimulation. That may not, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mouthful and it, and it sounds like uh, a lot to handle, but it's actually a very simple brain stimulation <laughs> technique that actually shortens the treatment of standard TMS, which is about 38 minutes long to three minutes long. So it's actually a treatment that is not only very, very easy to tolerate, but it is actually relatively easy. I mean, you can imagine that if you're experiencing depression um, and receive a treatment that is between three and five minutes, as opposed to, to, to 30 and 40 minutes, that allows you to have uh, uh, a significant more time in your day and has a less impact on you and is just easier to tolerate and, and allows us as clinicians, um, affords the, us the ability to treat more patients in any given day and as we know, there's a real difficulty in getting patients into treatment um, based on the numbers that Dr. Perry mentioned. And so um, I, I think being able to offer theta burst stimulation, which is one of the new types of TMS that we're offering here at Dove Cannon, 
um, significantly enhances our ability to deliver these treatments more efficiently. Great, thank you very much. I think this has been um, a, a great introduction to people uh, for our various treatments and the commonality of neuroplasticity for the TMS, the psilocybin, the ketamine, um, other types of, of treatments. And so um, thank everybody uh, for uh, your questions. We didn't get to them all, but uh, hopefully we can put something together with frequently asked questions and send that out.